definition of humility is I have a passionate desire and longing to experience all of my own emotions. So if I don't have that, then what will happen is I'll create addiction so that I can avoid some of those emotions. That's what I'll do. So humility is the key to growing spiritually. If we understand humility. Humility doesn't mean humiliation, does it? It's two totally different things. All right. One other thing I want to talk about is to actually begin focusing on your own desires. Now, so many times people come up to me and say, look, um, I thought about doing this. And off they tell me what it is. What do you think of that? And you know what my feelings are every time? It's pointless you're asking me this question. Because my feelings every time are, what do you want to do? Do it. And then they say, well, but what if it's wrong? What if it's not in harmony with love? Well, you're actually going to feel the law of compensation kick in when that happens. Yeah, and that's going to be your law of compensation, not mine. <laughs> Does that make sense? So allow yourself to do the things you desire. But remember one thing, that if what you desire is in disharmony with love, there will be pain associated with it. That's all you need to remember. So if you do it and you get some painful results, feel the emotions, feel what's coming up, right? That's all you need to do. Follow your desires and passions and feel what comes up. Now, if you know at the outset your desire or passion is in disharmony with love, for example, someone comes up, and this is a rare event, by the way, that someone comes up and says, oh, I want to kill such and such, what do you think I should do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, of course. But I have had people come up and say to me, I want to commit suicide. Um, could you tell me a little bit about the spirit world? Right? And my answer is, no. I'm not going to tell you about the spirit world how you want me to. What I'm going to do instead is tell you what happens when you suicide. And what actually goes on when you enter into the spirit world and what emotions you'll go through if you don't, if you don't deal with your emotions while you're on earth instead. I'll, I'll tell you all of that. But I'm not going to help you by making you feel good about passing into the spirit world. Does that make sense? So you see, all, that, all, that's, doing, all that's happening with p things like that is that we're often asking somebody else so that they can share in our misery. <coughs> if you loved another person, would you ask another person to share your misery? You wouldn't, would you? What you would do, would you even ask the other person to understand your misery? How, how can they understand your misery? They haven't been through it. It's a physically impossible, and even physically impossible at the soul level, for another person to feel your misery. Right? Or your joy. You see, to feel even your misery or your joy or any of your feelings, they're going to have to be you. And that's a physical impossibility. Every experience you have is going to be unique. Now, your soulmate is the one other person Will be, who will be able to completely experience your feelings. Because remember, the soul halves are like this, right? They fit together perfectly, and the emotions can cycle through the soul. That's what binds it. So, of course, the soulmate will be able to, at some point in your future, feel everything you feel and understand it. But they are the only being in the universe that is capable of doing that, aside from... God. So if you haven't found your soulmate or you're not sure you're with your soulmate, who do you need to connect to? God. Always. Who's your daddy? God. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. Now, what God wants for you to do is to focus on your own desires. God doesn't want you to ask me what you desire. You'd be surprised. This happens, this happens at every single group I've ever attended. 
people come up and ask me what they desire. What's going to be my future? What am I going to be involved in? Right? Even if I know, right? and many times I may, it makes no difference, does it? Because whose desire, who, who this desire do you need to follow? Your own. Your own. Not mine. So you will find that I'll avoid telling you things like that. Even if I know. Because you need to discover your own desires, your own passions, your own longings, and follow them. Not, not mine. I don't want to be responsible for your desires. I don't even want to be responsible for the desires that you have if you create universes. I'll be very happy to praise your desire for that, if that's what you want. But I don't want to actually be involved in your desires. And when I say involved in your desires, I mean in their creation and the joy you experience from actually fulfilling them. Because that is a very unique and personal experience that every single one of you will have if you stop involving other people in what you desire. Feel your own desires and passions and longing and go for them. 100% go for them. And you will feel the results when they're harmonious with love. You will feel the joys as a result of you following that. That's your reward, is your joy. No one else needs to praise you, lord you. In fact, the question I often ask people is, even if not a other single person on the planet agreed with your desire, would you do it? I'd do it. Wouldn't you do it? Yeah. Right? If not a other one person on the planet agreed with it. So stop asking other people whether they agree with what you're doing and just go ahead and feel whether it's harmonious with love and truth or not and if it is, do it and if it isn't, feel why the desire was there in the first place that was disharmonious with love and truth. That's all you need to do. Hi, sorry, i have just come here five minutes asking questions all the time. No, that's fine. Um, what about a desire of what God wants of you, like a Mother Teresa thing, like well, I'm developing a great love for, for God and I ask him, like, I want to do his work. Yeah, that's, that's a big emotional error. Is it? Yep. Okay. Um, what does God want for your soul? To be happy. Well, to recognise your own desires and do them. Okay. Isn't that what you want for your own children? To recognise their own desires and do them. Right? God doesn't... Now, God has purpose-built your soul for a reason. Right? Every one of your souls are unique. If you follow your own desires and passions, you will actually find what God designed to be your purpose. But you don't have to ask God, what's your will for me? What's your will for me? The will that God has for you is that you follow all of your own desires and passions and connect with God in love. That's the only will God has for you. And in amongst that, you have total unlimited scope. You can do anything you want. Now, every single one of you will be doing different things in that. Some of you will become world leaders. Some of you, and, and, lead, and, and leaders in the spirit world. Some of you will become musicians. Some of you will become artists. Some of you uh, who are 50 or 60 or 70 years of age and have never picked up a musical instrument in your life will pick up a musical instrument, learn to play it so perfectly that other people will come and listen to you in concert. Right? Because you've now feeling your passions and desires. Yeah? And what God wants for you, God's will for you, is that you feel what your own desires are that are harmonious with love and give them your 100% attention. All of them. Yeah. Is the emotional error um, not trusting ourselves then, if we're handling it? <laughs> No, the emotional error is wanting God to tell me what I should do. Because we don't trust our own... Why do I want God to tell me what I should do? Because I don't want to be responsible for making the choice to do it myself. And that's an emotional error, isn't it? Aren't I fully emotionally responsible for everything I choose to do? No matter who tells me? So I could tell you to go out and do something, you know, oh yeah, somebody said that I was going to get all of you to drink Kool-Aid at some point with poison in it, right? 
Now, if I said that, if I wanted that to happen, would you follow that? No. Of course not. Why, why not? Because you wouldn't be loving yourself you, and you wouldn't be following your own desires. Do you know what I mean? Like, why would I say such a thing to you? The, you see, whenever we want another person or God to tell me what I should do, I am already in an emotional error that I need to release within me myself. And once I release it, I will discover what I feel like doing. And ironically, when that occurs, then I'll actually be doing what God designed me to do. That's all I did in my life. I had to personally discover what my role, if you like, was. Does that make sense? You need to personally discover your own role. And God's not going to tell you it by just saying the words. Oh, your role is, oh, Klaus, your role is to become an engineer and become these things. And God's not going to say that to you ever. What God's going to do is really help you by your relationship with God, become at one with God, to actually connect with all of your passions and desires. And you'll know in the end what they are. And you'll feel them so strongly, you'll be driven to do it. And ironically, at that time, that's when you will be the most harmonious with what God designed you to be. It's a beautiful system, really, isn't it? Like, it's a process of self-discovery, God discovery, and also feeling the most passion and joy you can feel from anything because you've now discovered exactly everything about yourself through the entire process. Now, as soon as you get another person involved in that process, all you're doing is muddying up the water. Right. Now, just before we break, I want to give you an illustration. Um, that doesn't mean I'm going to draw it, by the way. <laughs> just imagine for a moment that I told you that I'd put a million dollars in your backyard. I'd buried it. Now, how many of you would go home and say, and sit down in front of the telly and go, yeah, AJ put a million dollars in the backyard. Can I trust him? <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> but, no, I can't trust him. We won't even bother finding out whether there's a million bucks in my backyard. Or how many of us would go home, watch a bit of telly and say, um, there's a million bucks in my backyard. That's really good, isn't it? But this television show is really interesting. <laughs> right? I think I'll watch that instead, right? Well, how many of us would uh, find, say, oh, there's a million bucks in my backyard, but, you know, I really need to get my friend's approval. And if my friends, they're going to, you know, they're going to look at my million dollars and get all jealous. So it's better I don't find it. <laughs> how many of you would do things like that? If you really believe there was a million bucks in your backyard. You know what the majority of you do? You would go there, you'd set up lights. <laughs> so you could do 24 by 7 until you found it. Agreed? All right. That's what I'm suggesting you do with truth. You see, the truth is going to be the most powerful thing you ever, ever have in your life. And until you have that attitude that it is the most important thing in your life, you will not understand the importance of truth. When it becomes the most important thing in your life, it will change your life completely. And you won't ever anymore want to have a rest from your emotions. You won't anymore want to have a rest from your law of attraction. You won't anymore want to have a rest from the law of cause and effect. You won't want to anymore have rest from the law of compensation. You will actually just go ahead and live in truth 100% of the time and love it. That's what will happen. And you'll do it because it's the most important thing that you value in your entire life. And when you do that, you will also become the happiest you could ever be. So that's what I'd like you to take away with yourself while you're having something to chew on. <laughs> and then we'll come back and talk about bigger world vision stuff. What I'd like to do now is... Uh, I want to introduce you to the ladies sitting next to me. 
You want to introduce yourself to everyone? Hello, I'm Luli. <laughs> Say all the rest. Uh, all the okay, rest. I'm Luli Faber and uh, I'm a neuroscientist and I've been coming here for about a year. Yeah, so Lily's been uh, listening to the divine love stuff for a year or so and practicing it a lot in her own life and uh, working her way through lots of different emotions, haven't you? And uh, in the process of doing that, really been following your desires a lot more strongly, haven't you? And so perhaps you could explain what's been happening, not just recently, but sort of what's happened leading up to what we're going to talk about, about science. Um, if you just explain how your job is coming about, like how, how it came about. Yeah, okay, so um, with my neuroscience research, uh, I've been working on how the brain processes emotions, but we use um, animal models for this work, and I've been doing that for the last 10 years. And I got to a point where I realized it was unloving to be killing animals for this research, and also I uh, realized that it seemed wrong to uh, be using animals as a model for humans anyway. It seemed like an artifact that wasn't very realistic. So, um, yeah, so I got to the point that I didn't want to work on animals anymore, so I went to the director of my institute and said to him uh, that, <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't, want to process, I don't want to work on animals anymore, I've lost motivation, uh, I want to be able to work from home and process emotions, I'm really into spirituality now. So what did you feel he would say at that point? Uh, <laughs> what were you thinking he would say before you did Well, that? I kind of had a priming meeting with my, the vice director yeah. who told me to go and talk to him, so I did have an inkling that he was going to try and find some other alternatives for me, yep, good. so I wasn't too terrified yeah. about that. Good. Um, and so he came up with this idea that I started doing some writing work. So I start um, reading other people's scientific papers and writing grant applications to the government to apply for scientific funding. Um, and I was like, hooray, and got very excited about that. And then, because um, it was creating a new position for me. Um, and then I realized, oh, this is all actually involved, still involved in animal studies, and I'll be reading about everyone else's animal studies, and I'll be uh, asking the government to supply more funds for animal studies, and so that was all wrong. So then I went back to him again and said, no, I can't do that either. Um, and, <laughs> and so he said, well, how about you start working on humans? And I was like, mm. And somehow... <laughs> well, no, okay, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> Not cutting them up. No, mainly because <laughs> it was a massive undertaking at work to change direction of uh, my focus of direction. Anyway, and somehow, miraculously, he came up with the idea that I should work on um, the effects of spirituality on the brain. And so I was like, oh, okay. So I thought, I was like, well, I'll go and think about it, about it again, because I wasn't entirely sure. And then um, so I went home, and over the next few days, I was kind of feeling about it. And then one morning, I was having a cry, and suddenly, all my life, all my adult life kind of came together and I understood why everything I'd ever done had led me to this point and that actually it was the whole meaning of my existence from God's perspective was to prove that you can use uh, emotional processing and divine love to cure neurological disorders. Um, so it was all pretty insane and I was very happy for a week. <laughs> <laughs> So after that sort of came to you, you then put forward some possible... Yeah, so my immediate thoughts were like, oh, okay, well, what can I do with yoga and meditation and stuff? And then, and then I, after I had this realisation, I was like, that's nothing. <laughs> Let's think bigger here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I thought, well, what can we do with divine love? And so the first thing I thought I'd do would be to plug myself into a, an EEG, which is a machine that records all your brain waves, and see what happens when I receive divine love. Uh, so anyway, so last Wednesday I did this, <laughs> and so I plugged myself in, and um, I set up this experiment where it was, it was really unscientific. <laughs> um, so there were three buttons and a timer, and uh, number one was control, uh, number two button was I'm receiving divine love a bit, <laughs> and number three was I'm receiving divine love a lot. Yeah. And so I did that, and actually the first time I messed it up, and then I did another study. But anyway, at the end of that, I was like, okay, I'm more relaxed now, I can do it. Yeah. Um, and so, oh, I should say, 
I missed out loads, actually. But I should say that... <laughs> she has missed out loads, actually. We're gone. <laughs> I've missed out loads about the fact that everything I've wanted to do on this path since I had this realisation has just completely fallen into place. Like, just everything's worked out ridiculously well. Um, and one of those things was I was thinking, how can I receive, how can I receive love without crying? Because it's going to muck up the recordings. <laughs> and, like, literally... <laughs> That's true, that's true. You can't, you can't move. Yeah, I know. Um, so anyway, and then like the next day, I started receiving love without crying. I was like, oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> awesome. So then I plugged myself in and I received love. Anyway, it did change my brainwaves quite a lot. Yeah. So, um, well, okay, I haven't really analysed it properly. Yeah. But basically what happened is all over the frontal area, which is the part of your brain that's the most evolved in humans and the bit that's kind of meant to be our higher spiritual, higher thinking, higher consciousness part of our brain, that changed its oscillations to a, what's called an alpha frequency, um, which is more meant, which is very up Peter and Claire Street. <laughs> um, and so that's meant to be a more kind of inward thinking, kind of calming sensation. And I should say that when I was receiving the love, it was a lot. It was just like I'd received, like, go rid of a causal and... Um, I felt very at peace at the time, so it kind of fit with that. And then in the areas at the rear of my brain where um, they're associated with um, like processing sensory information, you know, processing where you are in space and time, all that activity just went way down. Yeah. So it was like, I was like, hmm. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't like that. Oh, no, no, I just. <laughs> I'm just saying it Homer, you know, like Homer's <laughs> the Mind <laughs> Hub. But um, so um, what you're looking for now is some test subjects, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And so um, <laughs> what, we'll do it after after the uh, group. If you want to be a test subject, if you come up and see. Lurdy with this. There's going to be some controlled experiments, but it's also going to mean that you um, you need to understand when you are receiving divine love and when you aren't. Without um, moving your head. And you need to that not really move hard. your head. <laughs> no, no, because I always used to kind of notice it by moving my head to the side a bit. That's yeah. how I'd feel it the most. And yeah. so I was sitting there going, is it, is it? Is it <laughs> hitting me a bit? Yeah. 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 So, so the key is to um, just do a little bit more of experimentation, but a bit more controlled now, isn't it, in terms so of scientific, in the way you present it? Yeah, I mean, I want to do it really properly so yeah. that people believe it. Yeah. Um, so I need, um, from this group of people, <laughs> I'd like to, like, I'd like some control subjects who don't know anything about divine love, just to plug them in and say, uh, ask for divine love, and they'll just be like, what? Oh, and then nothing <laughs> happened, right? Yeah. And then I'd like uh, people who are sufficiently unblocked that they think that they can receive divine love without crying. And I think God will be helpful, so if you're a bit mm, then, you know, I reckon you might get a helping hand <coughs> on this. Um, so I need a group of them, and yeah, um, the trouble is you're left handed. Ideally, everyone would be right handed. <laughs> Um, and also, I need some people who are blocked, who really want divine love, but can't process their emotions, and so that when they ask for divine love, they, they don't receive it, but it kind of and, uh, Or you feel frustrated or angry when you're not receiving and it. And it models the desire yeah. and the intent in your brain. Because yep. obviously a lot of people will think that what's happening to me is just, uh, you know, psychological. I want, I want this effect to happen, and so that's why it's happen. happening. Mm. So but if anyone's interested. <laughs> now, the reason why I brought Lily up is because it's illustrating to you how when you follow your passions and desires and you live in harmony with truth, eventually you get to a point of discovering what you really want to do. And then when you get to the point of discovering that, everything seems to start fitting around that and making that happen for you. Does that make sense? That's exactly how my life's unfolded and it's exactly how Lily's life's unfolding. Now, you've done a lot of emotional processing and... Uh, and you've told me how you've worked through lots of different things, including a lot of soulmate type emotions as well. So still going. Still going through those. And so you've done a lot of grieving and crying, haven't you, to get to this place where you can actually ask for divine love and receive it a lot of the time. Yeah. So it's just to bear that in mind is that it takes, you know, a lot of desire to get to that point where you're receiving that as well. Is there anything else you'd like to... No, I think that's there, it. There's a whole series of experiments I know that you... You know, oh, uh, planning I could talk for about the future. Them, sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do you yeah. want me to talk about it? Well, just a few of them. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, 
what I'd, li oh, I'd like to do imaging, so people have heard of MRI, yeah? Um, so I'd like to do imaging experiments as well. So if you can keep still while you're receiving divine love, you, um, EEG is really good for seeing things in, in terms of timing wave. yeah. and, wave and mm. the waves. But um, with MRI, you can actually identify the anatomy much better. Mm. Um, and I want to try and find, because each of those would only take like 10 minutes, I want to try and find, uh, or devise some psychological type experiments that will try and model somehow a higher state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So showing more compassion, more empathy, yep. um, possibly you know, higher cognitive processes. Yep. So yeah, in terms of how it affects you even in your day-to-day -day life with how you, how you interact with the universe around you. Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, ability to read other people's emotions, kind of concentrate, just to kind of try and correlate changes in people's brains over time with, with the amount of divine love. Because at this stage it's pretty hard with the measuring instruments to actually measure the soul itself. So what we're trying to do here is, what Ludi's trying to do is measure the effects of the soul's changes on the body itself. Does that make sense? And particularly on the neurological part of the body. I thought of one more. Yeah, a really important go, one actually. Um, this would be good for anyone who's into processing. It could be good if, if it was the same people who do the uh, other tests as well. So I'd like to try and um, bring people into the lab and trigger their fear and measure, because you can measure fear with um, just measuring skin conductance or heart rate. And um, so like we've got really nasty spiders at work and stuff yeah. like that. Uh, <laughs> I, can do, I haven't done that one yet either. <laughs> Um, so trigger the fear and measure the responses and then get them to go away and process the emotion and then come back and show that the fear has gone. Does that make sense? Things like that. Okay. That's in Brisbane, University of Queensland. I'll probably be having a job, out of a job quite soon. <laughs> but everyone finds out what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't think so. I think you'll find that everything will just fit together. Yeah. So, um, so what, what's, uh, what, what has been so joyful for me watching and for Mary too watching Lily's progress is how much, because she's actually putting into practice the truth in her life. So she's not just ignoring speaking the truth, right? She's actually putting that in practice, going to a job and saying, I'm not happy with this job, right? And they go and create another job for her, <laughs> you know? And, and if, if she hadn't dealt with certain emotions, they might have kicked you out, actually. And so the fact is that Lulu's had to work through the emotions each time before she's gone to do something as well, haven't you, basically? And, and I think it illustrates uh, to a large degree how if you follow your passions and desires and you deal with the emotional responses, how rapidly your life can change around you. And it's starting to change personal relationships now as well, isn't it, unfortunately? <laughs> <laughs> Lily's had some uh, realizations recently too of who her soulmate is, and it's not my partner, and it's not her partner. So she's we're having to work through those emotions as well. So it's very good, brave girl. Leave on a high note, eh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's just I think it's just fascinating because. Um, in the future, scientifically, there will be lots of proof available that what I'm teaching you is the truth. And, uh, but it's only going to be proven by people like yourselves who actually follow it firstly and experiment with it. And if so if any one of you has got a scientific bent, an engineering bent and those kind of things, you'll find a lot of your passions would be drawn into this path, if you like, of proving to the world that it actually is true. That brings up another thing. How many of you have thought of, uh, kine ha have used or know of kinesiology? Yes. Oh, okay, most of you. So, um, is it, what's his name again? David Hawkins? Yeah. Yep. Um, remember he made uh, the scale of consciousness? Where he goes duh, 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 upscale and zero to 1000. And it actually is infinite, uh, the scale of consciousness. Um, it's only infinite, of course, while you're on the divine love path, right? Now, what he did was he rated uh, Buddha. Uh, I can't remember how to spell Buddha's name. Sorry, Buddha. Where's my... Double D-H-A, isn't it? 
and he rates myself at that location. He's, he's quite uh, inaccurate about that, but anyway. Um, <laughs> And in between there, there's different scales, and the humanity, I think, is around 200 or just under. Uh, and then it goes up from there on the average, right, until 1,000 and so forth. And there's actually scales above. Um, he stops at 1,000, but he does recognise that the love coming from what he called an angel, an archangel, is 10,000. Or something like that. 50,000 or something like that. Anyway... <coughs> The reason why I bring this up is because um, on the earth a lot of people have been testing different teachings and finding teachings fit in certain ranges. So a lot of religious teaching, Christian religious teaching, has been tested by Hawkins. I forget what he came and in and out about, I think it was about 300 or 350 or something like that on the average. And then there's, there's testings that he's done about different religions like so the Muslim religion and other different faiths, the Buddhist faith and so forth. And he's made all of these tests and scales, and so he's come up with number and systems that are between, you know, usually around 200 to around about 1,000. Okay, so what's happened is that recently we caught up with uh, some friends of ours uh, who are here today. Uh, can you just put up your hand, Joy? Who are members of a Pascus found Foundation, it's called. And they've been using testing a lot of your life, haven't you? So you've been using this testing process to work out things, this so kinesiology or muscle testing type things, this scale of consciousness to test what they're going to include in their foundation, which is basically an organisation. And the organisation has been set up for a lot of different reasons and perhaps John at some point uh, can actually illustrate those reasons, but he has a document if you want to receive it from John, I'm sure he'd be happy to uh, send it to you. What's your email, John? J E L J E D O E L at finance facilities dot com. Right. So if you would like to receive their general overview. John spent many, and Joy and others, have spent many years putting together what I feel is a really loving organisation in the sense that his organisation is based upon the whole process of just giving gifts, basically. So gifting time, gifting funds, gifting things to others to, in order to get things done. And all things to do with love. And so what they've been doing a lot is testing, using kinesiology, testing different things, right? And in this process, around three years ago or so, you, you tested that there was a, what you called a master, somewhere in Queensland, didn't you? Like, yes, we were, we were aware of And if I get you to speak into the mic. <coughs> three, years, three years ago, we were aware of a master living somewhere north of Brisbane, just north of Brisbane, but didn't know who he or she was. It turns out it was he and she. And what was the name that you, you called him? We referred to the master that we were going to have at a function that we are planning for in the Bahamas as Emmanuel. But uh, we've since corrected that name. And if you just speak into the mic, sort of like more directly like that, John, it'll be clearer. Since, since, uh, since understanding who the Emmanuel was, we've retyped it as AJ and Mary. <laughs> Emmanuel, by the way, means with us is God, and it was a sort of a nickname in a way that I was given way back in the first century and also in Bible prophecies before then. But anyway, and by the way, that's not saying I'm God. So don't you think that that's what I'm saying? We, we did ask uh, what your nickname was the last time we were here, but uh, now we know it's Emmanuel. <laughs> now, what uh, has been happening is I've been testing all different types of teachings. Is that not correct? And... And about the highest teaching you've ever tested was in the 900 somewhere, wasn't it, before we met? Would that be about right? Yep. Now, what happened is, is he started a process. I talked to John and Joy about this process that actually on the divine love path, this scale of consciousness, of course, is infinite. So therefore, you need to test above a 1,000 for different things. So he started testing all of the DVDs that I've been presenting. We, we tested the DVDs subsequent to 
becoming more aware of the work and readings of the Paget papers. And typically the DVDs that we are, have tested have calibrated around the 1400s to 1500s. A couple went over 2000, we just stopped at 2000. Yep. Uh, in the past we have never found a DVD anywhere <coughs> of profound work that calibrated over 700. Hmm. Um, using the techniques basically described by Hawkins. Hmm. Yep. Now, um, now what we've done recently is just tested some prayers. Interesting. Peter had been handed out. Have you handed out a prayer to some people or not? No, you, you oh, made a couple, a couple you made up a prayer and handed it out. And remember, I said to you that I feel that it's not um, at the right place. Um, the, the original prayer that I gave to Paget has been tested at 10,000. The one that we handed out originally, that's been laminated? Yeah. The prayer that you modified for the, for the purpose of your subliminal CDs that you wanted to do, tested at 2,000. So there's a fair bit of difference, or 2,400 or something like that, wasn't it? 2,650. Yep. When, when I tested the prayer that you're holding in your hand, Joy's arm just kept on raising and raising and raising, and that rarely happens. And it's, it was well over ten thousand, but short short of uh, eleven thousand. But yeah. it's easy to remember ten thousand. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so can you see how different things? If we expand our mind a little straight away it can affect what we test and everything else. And this is something that scientists, in fact, on the Earth need to actually understand. And that is that the more they raise their level of consciousness into a wider viewpoint, the more is going to become available to them in terms of experiments, proof, and all of these other things that we need to prove whether we're on a path or not. Um, Peter, you are? <coughs> The other thing Hawkins mentioned was that uh, one person at a level of 700 on his scale uh, counterbalances 50 million people below 200 that are more negative than they are positive and that yeah. one person at a level of uh, 1,000 is powerful enough to counterbalance the negativity of the entire world. Yep. Okay. And you all can be at 1,000 <laughs> or greater. Okay. So that's... Now, the thing that we need to understand in all of this is this. That actually it's your soul condition changing that changes the world. It's not as much what you do as the changes you are within you. Now, the changes you are within you will if certainly affect what you do and therefore have a flow-on effect. So, you imagine for a moment, if you're living in your passion and desires completely, 100% of the time, you're connected with God and you're at one with God 100% of the time. And you, you can see already with like Luli's example how everything's sort of starting to fit into place for you. Everything's starting to come together. Is this exactly what you want to do? And who knows, there might be still a few emotions that are going to be confronted in this process, right? But already, things are starting to fall into place, right? And this is what will happen the more you follow your passions and desires. Now, many of us don't follow our passions and desires because we're so afraid. And fear has a very, very limiting effect on, our, on us. Now, the reason why I raise this is because one of the major problems in the world that we have today that affects what I feel is the world vision is our fear. You see, most of us in the Western world believe problems that are external or let's call it, instead of the Western world, maybe the developed world. Most of us believe that the developed world issues and problems are separate to the undeveloped world issues and problems. And many of us don't see strong correlations between what's occurring in the Western world and what's occurring in other parts of the world. You see, a third of the world's population is involved in the Western world or the developed world. Two-thirds of the world population is in the developing so-called countries. 
I've got no idea why they call them the developing countries. Because in reality, they are, I would call the countries being raped, basically. <coughs> so I'd much rather, sorry about that, I'd much rather use my uh, words a lot more bluntly, I think. Because the truth is that we, I haven't got anything in my face, have I? <laughs> <laughs> that we in the... Uh, <laughs> That we in the developed world, <laughs> sorry about that, don't want to see my saliva and... Uh, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, that we in the developed world often um, believe ourselves to not be responsible for what's going on around the west of the world. The truth is though that we, and Australia is one of these countries, um, we utilise 83% of the world's resources. So one third... So you're talking about 33% of the world's population use 83% of the world's resources. Now, is this loving? No. Obviously not. Now, the problems that this creates are immense. And we don't understand them. Uh, many, and many, by the way, leaders understand the problems but have no desire to fix them because fixing them would mean some of us actually having less. And you know what the problem is for most of us? We have some emotions that we need to work our way through. One is an emotion of lack. We never seem to be happy with enough. Right. Instead, we want more than enough. And, we, want, and we're, we also have an emotion of fear. We are afraid of the future so much that we feel now that we've got to have $50,000 sitting in the bank before we can be secure. Do you know how much $50,000 would pay for in a country in Africa? One, most people in Africa earn one dollar a week. Fifty thousand dollars, that's a thousand years almost. Is that a dollar a week, sorry. If it's a dollar a week, how many weeks in a year? Three hundred and fifty, sixty, five <laughs> days in a year. Sorry, that's in a days, but let's look at it. This is a week, so we're looking at $52 a year. $52 a year into $50,000. let us say it's 50 bucks a year. That's a thousand people's food sitting in your bank. Not just food. A thousand people's lives sitting in your bank account. Does that make sense? You see, we need to start feeling about this. Now, I'm not suggesting you do anything about it because it's up to you what you do, right? What I'm suggesting is that you start feeling about it. The reason why I would like, this is my vision, one of my visions, is that every single person in Western civilization starts feeling about what they're doing to this planet and to the people on it, just by the choices that we're making that we think we have the right to make. Mary? <coughs> I just wanted to share that when I met you, I was on, I was on a path of um, trying to save the world, <laughs> living in developing countries, and um, mm. because I felt very strongly about these issues, I had a lot of emotions about it. Yeah. And when I met you, I I was quite uh, one of the many beautiful emotions I've projected at you. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying, what are we doing here? We're just sitting around talking to middle class Australians who, you know, what are we going to be doing to help the world? And you very rightly pointed out to me that these are the people, Mary, who um, have the opportunity to deal with their emotions and also they're the people who are using the resources and um, are involved in the systems that are causing people to remain downtrodden. So yeah, yeah. How can you think about dealing with your spirituality when you don't even have enough to eat in a day? It's going to be very difficult, don't you think? To actually, so, so for, for us, from, from my perspective in terms of my world vision, 
How am I going to reach six and a half billion people when four and a bit billion people are starving? And they, they, they want to know where they're going to get their next meal, let alone how, how they're going to deal with spirituality at that level. Not even their very basic physical necessities are being met. Right? Now the only way for that to occur is this 33% who use this 83% start changing here. Do you follow me? And that's something for you to ponder about for your own lives. Allow yourself to start thinking about that. How can you better use the world's resources? Now, I've talked often about eating meat. Let's look at some moral issues. Like, when I eat meat, I am using 20 times the amount of worse resources than I would use if I was eating something that wasn't meat. Can you see why like, the rainforests in the Amazon are being ripped out and put in instead as cattle farms, cattle stations? Because they want to supply your meat. Or not your meat necessarily, because here in Australia we have a lot of meat, but you can see what's happening to the environment here. Like, what's happening to the environment here just with the eating of meat? They're going along and actually poisoning the trees. And you see them here in Queensland like a lot. Now you, dead trees everywhere, in, out in the cattle's country, dead trees everywhere because it's not high yield to have the trees. Trees cover a lot of ground, therefore not as much food, not as much stuff gets grown and therefore not as much cattle can stay on it. And there's all these things that we're doing, we're doing, by our choices that we're making. So my, one of my world vision fantasies, if you like, and I believe that it's not a fantasy but it's actually a reality, something we can create together, is that every single person on this planet has clean water to drink, they have clean water to wash and bathe in, they have food that's harmonious with divine love in abundance, and they have clothing, beautiful clothing available to them, and they have shelter at a high standard available to them, and it's all available to them for free. with one proviso, that if they're able to work, they work. So in other words, the person who goes out surfing every day and doesn't want to work for a bit of it, right, doesn't get the handout of it. He's okay to go out surf every day if he's already done some work for looking after himself. Does that make sense? Just basic principle. If I'm expecting you to provide for my needs, then I am not loving to you. It's a very basic principle. Now, just that thing of eating meat, for example, means that if the entire population of people on the planet who ate meat stopped eating meat, our food resources would increase by 19 to 20 times. Right? Now that's that just that one statistic is amazing, isn't it? Like, now you add these statistics together and you can see straight away that there's a lot of changes that need to happen at the soul level. So one of the things I wanted to do to discuss with you today was about, if you like, my dreams for the future or my vision of the future, being a part of dealing with these emotions so much that we actually feel we're abundant creatures and that we actually do not hoard things when other people are starving. Do you follow me? That we actually start sharing with others. And we can practice it in our environment, but we can also, even now, practice it with other countries. Now, when these 33% of people get to the point where they no longer use 83% of the world's resources, but use much, much less than 33% of the world's resources, now we're at least in a state of equality. But we've still got a problem. At home, do you ever use all of your own resources? Because that doesn't leave anything for a rainy day, isn't that the saying? Right? So in the end, we're going to have to get this figure even down below that, aren't we? In terms, of, uh, in terms of being able to help the environment and help the country and help 
the world. Now, if every single person on the planet had those basic things available to them, how much do you think it would be easy to be a terrorist, for example? Like if everyone around you was happy and you wanted to be a terrorist to create problems, do you think everyone around you would go, yeah, yeah, let's go for that? It only comes from everyone around you being unhappy, doesn't it? And in fear and so forth. Now, also, where did that terrorist, if we can use the word in quotations, come from? He came from this environment of oppression. <coughs> who created this environment of oppression? The 33% who use the 83% of the world's resources. Can you see from God's perspective, we are even a part of creating this kind of oppression just by the choices we make. Now, what I'm suggesting to you is to start allowing yourself to look at this as a moral issue because it is a moral issue. It's an issue with regard to love of your neighbour, which is always a moral issue. Allow yourself to start considering what you can do to actually make these changes. The first set of steps is this. Number one is be humble. Now, what's the definition of humble again? <coughs> Having a passionate desire and longing to feel and experience all of your own emotions. Right? Now you think about it. If I've got an emotion of lack, instead of acting upon my emotion of lack, what will I do? I will firstly choose to feel it and experience it and work out what it's about in my childhood. Does that make sense to everyone? If I have an emotion of greed, right? what will I choose to do? Not act upon it, but <coughs> Feel the greed and then feel what's underneath the greed. And usually it's the emotion of lack, right? And so forth and what's going on underneath that. Allow yourself firstly to deal with your emotions. Being humble is all about that. Now I'm assuming by the way all of you are wanting to pray for divine love in all of this. So obviously that's the first things. What I'm talking about are practical things you can do right now to start dealing with these issues. The second thing is act in harmony with divine truth. Stop talking about truth and start acting on the truth. Now many of you are, are still not doing this, right? Many of you are being untruthful in your day-to-day -day actions. Many of you, when somebody rings you up and says, oh, what's going on here or there? And you say, you act as if you know when you don't really know. So say, why not, why not say, I don't know? Because we're not humble to feel the emotion that I, oh, I don't know. That's all. Right? So act in truth. Truth exposes all emotion. If you don't act in truth, you will not be able to expose your emotions. The beauty also of truth is that when you're uncompromising with the truth, everything around you gets addressed. Now, many of you are refusing truth. You're saying to me, please give me more truth. Please give me more truth. On a personal level, many of you are doing this. And to be frank with you, I can't give you more truth because you haven't even accepted the truth you've already received. Here. Does that make sense to everyone? You need to accept the truth here in your heart. When you accept the truth here in your heart, changes will happen in your life. Then you'll be ready to hear more truth. Right? One thing a lot of people don't realise is this is what goes on inside of us. Here's my current condition. Let's say my current condition is in the first sphere. Right? Many of you already have had this happen to yourself where you've realised your current condition. It's a terrible realisation. Many of you feel that, right? Where you've actually come to the point of recognising whoa, if this is all true, I have got so much to deal with. Right? That's that realisation. And it's not just an intellectual realisation, it's a like, it really hits you in your heart, right? Whoa. Like, and there's a real temptation in this space to judge yourself, right? To say, whoa, how bad am I? Right? Now, there's no point in judging yourself, 
But you, is, you need to, point, to be honest with yourself. So we need to be honest with ourselves. Here I start. This is where the world is currently. We want to get to the point where the world is way above this in terms of its consciousness, if you could call it that. I would call it in terms of their reflection of love, right? We want to be way up there, but at the moment this is where we're beginning and the majority of us on the planet begin at this place. I began in the hells in this life in terms of where I was feeling emotionally. Here's all the spheres, right, of progression. This is occurring whether we're on earth or in the spirit world. As you hear truth into your mind, what happens is your mind knows truth to be at a certain location. But unless you do the emotional work, you are setting up a gap between where your mind is and where your soul is. Can you see that? So let's say my mind's received enough truth for me to be in the second sphere. And many of you, by the way, your mind has received enough truth for you to be at one with God at this point. Many of you have received enough truth in your mind. All right? But many of us are still in the first sphere with our emotions. Our soul condition is still in the first sphere. What does that do? That creates this huge discrepant gap between the two states. So here's the state of our mind up here. Here's the state of our soul here. And how do you reckon this is going to feel? It's going to feel really bad. This is why many of you are starting to feel bad. Because what's actually happening is you're receiving truth constantly but not letting go of the emotions inside. Does that make sense? And if you don't let go of the emotions inside, what happens is your soul stays at the same amount and your mind's trying to grasp more and more and more and more truth. But it's not real. It's a, it's a fictitious place. The only time it's going to be real is if you feel the truth in your soul. So what I'm suggesting is look at your life and be humble and act in truth and you will every time it will be exposed to you when you're out of harmony with love. Every time. It's so simple. It's, you need courage to do it though. But it is very simple to apply. So many of you, I notice, you know, you tell your little fib here and a little lie there, even to yourself, right? And when truth is told to you, you just dismiss it because it's been told to you by a man or a woman or a child and you think that they are not worthy to tell you of the truth or whatever. Or it's been so, there's been so much indoctrination inside of us about, you know, doing everything on a spirit, on a metaphysical level that we just can't get away from the metaphysics and into the love space and when we do all of those things all we're doing is avoiding being humble and avoiding living in truth that's all we're doing and the changes on this planet that will result in this world vision of being able to actually feed every person on the planet is very dependent on a core group of people beginning this process can you see why? Because it's your soul that is the real you that creates everything around you. And without that changing, nothing changes. That's why it's so important. Right? Now, if you can do those things, just those two things alone, if you just make a resolution in your heart, I'm going to be humble, which is... <laughs> so let's say it all together. Humble is... <laughs> Feel and experience all of your own emotions. Exactly. And if I can be humble and I act in truth with everything. You don't have to believe in God to do this, by the way. Do you? You don't have to believe in God to do this. If you don't want to believe in God or you can't trust that God exists, you can still do this. Can you not? Yeah. Every single person on the planet needs to do this. If we don't do this, what's going to happen is we're going to finish up projecting emotions at other people, we're going to start damaging emotions through our own pain, and in the end, we get what we've got now. 
which is lots of wars, lots of famine, lots of poverty, lots of terrible treatment of all sorts of people, terrible treatment of women, terrible treatment of women, w children, you know, 50 million ch children dying every year from abortion, and we've got this totally, like this, this whole list of things going on, all unloving, which is all having an effect on the soul condition of where we live. We can change all of that. We can change it all just by doing those two things. Now, of course, if you receive divine love and do those two things, things can happen a lot faster. So that would be my recommendation, but you don't have to do that. But this is where we need to go. Now, if we go this direction, and my full conviction is that we will, right? what happens is that every single war place of our life will change. The politics that we have surrounding us will change. The economic system we have surrounding us will change. The religious system we have around us will change. The education system, the scientific system, the health system, all will change. And they need to change. Every system needs to change. Now, we can either be leaders in the change or followers, that's up to us. And we've got that choice. My desire myself is I want to change. And even if I want to only change so that I can be closer to God and closer to my soulmate, that is going to have an automatic effect on the rest of the world. And I need to understand that. If I'm humble and act in truth, everything around me will change. I need to be emotionally prepared for change on the divine love path. I can't keep everything the same. Everything the same is just going to get more of the same. Do you want more of the same in your own life personally or in your political life, you know, in the politics around you or whatever? Do you want the same economic system? What do you want? Now, most people will listen to this and say, Jesus is all just a highly utopian dream. It's not. We are totally capable of creating a world that's without any of the strife and problems that it currently has today. But only if we do these two things. Can you see that? If you're not humble, you know what's going to happen? The very first time it's pointed out to you that you have a certain fault, you're going to get angry. And you know what happens when a country points out to the other country that they're at fault? War. It's exactly the same. And this is what happens inside of you, the same emotion as the country. Right? Every single war in history has been caused by people not being humble. <laughs> you think about it, if you're humble, collectively, you would listen to them and say, oh, they're, not very, they're very critical of my country. Mm. And if I didn't have an emotion about it, would I react? No. Not at all. If I had an emotion about it, what would I do? I would feel it. I would experience it and release it, and it's not there anymore. I wouldn't go to war about it. No matter whether they killed my child or my wife or anybody, I still wouldn't go to war about it. All right? I would actually just feel my own emotions about it. That's all I would do. You see, everything that's happening in the world, you look at everything where there's turmoil and problems, everything is based upon people not wanting to feel their grieving emotions. And instead, what do we do? Somebody does something to us, we feel almost start to feel this emotion of grief within us and then we shut that down and what do we do instead? We get angry. When we get angry, what do we start doing? We start automatically trying to damage the other person oftentimes. We turn anger usually into revenge if the situation is terrible enough. So what happens if a person comes along and kills your child? You're going to have terrible emotions if they're within you of wanting revenge. Don't act upon them. Be humble. Feel the emotion. Experience what's going on inside of you. The grief that's going on inside of you. The unfairness of what happened. Everything. Experience it. Release it from you. In the spirit world, you need to experience the emotion. As soon as you act on it, instead of experiencing it and go into revenge, you are now creating more negativity around you. Automatically. And this is the world we live in now. This world that we live in is like this. 
And you think in your own life how many times you've somebody said something to you and instead of owning your own emotions, you've got angry with them. Think about that. And think about what's underneath that. Let yourself feel about it. Does that make sense? Because the world vision, so you know this world vision that I just stated, which is that every man, woman and child on this earth has enough pure drinking water, has enough water to bathe in, has enough food that is harmonious with love, has shelter and has clothing, all harmonious with love. For that to occur, 33% of the world's population firstly have to change. Remember? The 33% of the world's population who use the 83% of the world's resources, they need to change. And they is us. We're a part of that. We need to change. The only way we can change is by these things. This is how important it is to the rest of the world that we do this. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel responsible for the rest of the world. <laughs> but the truth is that actually if you're using 83% of the world's resources, you have made yourself responsible for two and a bit other people. Because you're using their food, their resources. Does that make sense? So in doing that, we have made ourselves responsible from in God's eyes for what's happening to them just by that simple fact so what can we do about this there's lots of things we can do about this the first thing is to make soul changes like soul changes so that's what needs to happen soul change needs to happen inside of me when it happens inside of me it'll start happening around me. Everything will change, start changing around me. Ask yourself some questions about how dedicated am I to actually experiencing myself? Is it something that takes up 10% of my time, 20% of my time, 50% of my time, or 100% of my time? How, how much of my time do I use to make soul changes? And when I feel angry about the fact that I'm not making progress, do I even deal with that? Do I go out and bash the bag and, you know, yell and scream and swear at God if that's what I need to do to get underneath that emotion and back into feeling some causal emotion that will make my soul change? Allow yourself to do that. Now, when your soul changes, everything around you will change. And what I'd like to do is just describe some of the changes that will happen around you. And I'm talking about global changes now. I'm not talking about individual changes because there's going to be heaps of individual changes in all this. But now I'm talking about global changes. I'm talking about the changes that will happen in politics, in religion, in science, in all of these different areas. But it needs leaders in each area to make changes. Like how does the scientific community change when there's not one person in the scientific community that actually believes in the spirit world? Can it receive any inspiration from the spirit world? It needs like 10, 20, 100, 1,000, 10,000 10, who are scientists who actually believe in the spirit world before there'll be any interaction between the spirit world. And someone needs to lead that and demonstrate that. That someone could be one of you. Here we go. What do you got? Right? How about in areas of religion? Many of you in your entire lives have been passionate about different religious forms. Have you not? In your, in your, par, in your past life, <laughs> if we can call your past life, this life you've experienced. You've been passionate about religion. There must be something inside of you that causes you to do that. How would you like to be involved in changing this entire religious system? Like, you think about where, how does it need to change? Firstly, it needs to understand divine love, doesn't it? It needs to understand that it's not the same as natural love, that it's a totally different thing. And divine love principles can be incorporated into every single religion. <coughs> Instead, what's happening? If you're not of my faith, I condemn you. Have I got the right to condemn anyone? Does God even condemn anyone? 
So I'm setting myself up above God when I actually condemn the other person for them not practicing what I'm practicing. So why would I ever condemn anyone? I, but I can incorporate truths into their existence by talking to them about the truths, asking them to experiment about them. You see, there's so many human institutions that are based around keeping everything the same. And what does that support? Well, if it's in religion, what does it support? It supports the power of the priest. The priesthood. The priesthood has set itself up in such a way that what it's going to do is it's going to tell you what you should do. And when you don't do it, it's going to try to punish you. You look at all the doctrines, many of the doctrines of the Christian religion. This is exactly how they came about. You do what we say. We say, we say not, not we say, which is the truth, but instead we say what God says. So in other words, I say, oh, God says if you're not a certain type of religion, then you're condemned. Does, has God ever said that to any person? No. It's what we say. You see? But they say, they've set it up so that what we say, the priesthood says, is what God says. Now, unless I am in, developed in love myself, will I know that that's true or not? I won't, will I? And I'll blindly follow a religious form that condemns or that causes all sorts of trouble. Do you know the entire black population of the earth at one point in time was condemned by Christianity? They said that they were, they were the descendants of um, one of, no, no, one of uh, Noah's sons. You heard of Noah? One of his sons actually saw him naked, right? And because of his own personal shame, he became the father of the black race. And the black race bears the curse of Noah against his son. That was their definition. This was, this was actually the Christian support for slavery in the 17th, 16th and 17th centuries, right? Okay. Does that sound loving to you? <laughs> okay, but they justified it by saying what God says. How do you think a holy war occurs? Is there anything holy about war at all? <laughs> On any side? How does a holy war occur? Because somebody says that God says we should do it. Right? Now if I'm humble and I'm willing to feel all of my own emotions and I'm willing to live in truth, I won't go to fight in this holy war. Even if I'm killed, I won't go to fight in this holy war. Will I? In the uh, Second World War, you know that many Jews were actually put into concentration camps. Yes? Well, there are other people who were put into concentration camps too that you never ever really hear about. Um, lots of Poles, there were lots of Russians, and, uh, and in fact more Russians died in the Second World War, more Russian people who were not military people died in the Second World War than did Jews or of many other nations in fact. Right? And when you look historically, there was also groups of people who were called conscientious objectors. Now you know you've heard of the Jehovah's Witness faith, right? They were a group of people in the Second World War who were conscientious objectors. They were put into concentration camps and killed because of their refusal to go to war. And do you know how hard that is for a Jehovah's Witness? That is very hard. And you know why? Because they don't believe that you have a spirit body. They don't believe you have a soul that lives on. They believe that your soul dies when you die. So how hard's that? They don't even have a belief that could easily support it. They believed in a resurrection, but they believed that the soul and the spirit body dies. What I'm saying to you is that you do not even have to know the truth to be uncompromising in your personal truth. You don't have to know the divine truth to do it. There's been many people historically in the world who have, in historically, who have never known the divine truth and yet followed with conviction the truth of not harming another person, for example. So, a lot of religions say, we say, and they instead of say, we say, they say, God says, 
that you need to do this. Now, in the future, do you think religion's going to do this? But it needs people to show religion that, you know, what it's doing is not right. Now, there are already hundreds of thousands of people in different religions who already feel this way. They're just waiting for a catalyst. That's all they're waiting for. Uh, just a yeah, question on the mic. Yep. Um, just in all these areas of religion and politics and everything else, there's this minority that rules and that doesn't want to give up. And I feel like that's where there's that problem. Um, what's your comment on that? The minority cannot rule when the majority refuse to be ruled. So it's revolution we're talking about? Yeah, basically. But not a revolution that's violent. It's, not, it's the kind of revolution that, in a way, that Gandhi was trying to do in India, right? The kind of revolution that starts with everyone just saying, I'm not going to do the unloving thing anymore, and you can kill me even, and I'm still not going to do it. Now, that straight away takes away the power of anyone trying to force you to do it, doesn't it? Like, if all of us in Australia just decided, we are not going to pay tax anymore, and we all did it together, could they fill the jails with us? No. What would happen to the whole country? It would just go into rack and ruin, wouldn't it? So wouldn't the country be forced into changing the way we work? Yes. But how is that going to happen? It's going to have to happen by us changing our soul condition so much that we're willing to live in truth no matter what happens. It's the only way it's going to happen. Does that make sense to everyone? Right? Now, what that's going to mean is the first people who do it are going to need to be the most courageous. Now, that's the problem I face. The reason why I feel that way is because I don't know about you, but I'm still dealing with a lot of fears about like, how somebody might kill me. Now, the reason why I've got that in me is because how I have very complete memories of what happened to me in the first century about torture and abuse and so forth. There were not just, it wasn't just the time of my death that I was tortured, but there were a number of other times when I was tortured in the first century. And so I've had to work my way through those emotions so that I'm no longer afraid of death. Feel them, release the emotions. Many of us have a deep fear of pain or suffering or death. And we'll need to work our way through those emotions. Remember, if we're humble, we will work through these emotions. If we love the truth, it'll all come to us through our law of attraction and we'll be able to work through these emotions. We will be able to do that. The first people doing it need to have courage. And when you have courage, there was another quality too that you start to develop. And this is a quality that I've talked about a lot before and I want to have a complete four-hour discussion on this quality. And it's this quality of faith. Now, I'm not talking about some religious concept of faith. All right? You know, the religious concept is, um, gee, it's ten past five, I didn't realise that. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I haven't got long to go, have I? Um, the, the religious concept of faith is believe it even though you don't know it to be true. Isn't it? Like, just have this belief structure. And that's what they call faith. That's not faith, in my opinion. Faith, in my opinion, is based on the assured expectation of things hoped for. In other words, having a dream and knowing in your heart, via mechanism that you feel with God, knowing it in your heart that it's going to come true. Right? Now, every person, I've mentioned this before, every person who's ever made a scientific discovery has had this faith. The reason why is they knew in their heart there's something here, there's something in this, this you know, in the case of like penicillin, it was something in the human body, you know, and something we could fight. They knew it in themselves, they felt it. They trusted this intuition and then they went through this process of discovery. Their initial trust of this intuition is their faith. They're knowing that they'll be able to resolve the issue. Every one of you have built in you this ability to develop your faith. So what do we have faith about? We can have faith about all of the beautiful things that we can create when we're in the right soul condition. So if you can just give yourself time in each day, just to allow yourself to feel, and this is a really good uh, aspect of meditation, is to actually allow yourself to feel 
what your life will be without, without a certain emotion. So you imagine if you've got this emotion of rage in you, right? If you can just sit down for a moment and just imagine your life, your life without rage, that nothing makes you angry. Or sit down and imagine that nothing makes you afraid anymore. Imagine that. Because this is what faith is. Developing faith is imagining, if you like, a position that is fully achievable by you in, in your own development. Right? It's not, we're not talking about some pie in the sky, unimaginable things. We're talking about real things that can happen just by our exercise of these qualities. Now, if we have some faith, we will start to see that the world's politi political environment doesn't work. And I'm not talking just about like capitalism or what we call democracy, which is capitalism in disguise. Or, and I'm not just talking about things like communism or socialism or anything. I'm saying all of them don't work. Why don't they all work? Because they don't change the soul condition of people. They don't change the focus on the cause, what's going on. They also don't focus on getting the people together who can create a certain thing and giving them all the resources possible to create without a limitation of money. Right. Because when you look at that, look at it like, if all of the f food in the world was distributed, we'd all be fed. If all of the resources of the world were distributed, we'd all be closed, sheltered and everything. Not at the extent that the 33% are at the moment, but at the extent that it's going to be you know, harmonious with our environment. Now, if all that's done for free, do we need money anymore? And do we need to worry about, oh, how much money is there going to be to create this road anymore? Or this hospital anymore? Or this... And then we start dealing with soul-based causes. Imagine that. Imagine just for a moment, if you dealt with the soul-based causes of every physical infirmity that you could ever have, every disease, would we need to have pharmaceutical countries, companies anymore? Would we need to have these huge institutions dedicated to the maintenance and repair of the human body anymore? Can you see all those people involved in those industries, what could they do instead? You see, there's huge things they could do, isn't there? In terms of the well-being of the soul, the spirit, body, and just changing the education system of the world. Like, it just amazes me how much of man's resources are thrown at effects. And we don't ever <coughs> touch on the causes or deal with the causes. So, allow yourself to just sit down and feel about that, imagine a world like that, and then ask yourself some questions. What's my part in that? What would I like to do? What would I like to be involved in? Some of you might find, oh, I'd like to be involved in changing the political system. I might be like to be involved in changing the religious system. I might be like, like to be involved in the scientific system, the whatever systems it is, in certain areas. There are certain passions and desires that you'll start recognising within yourself and my suggestion then is to start living in truth with them. Start really pursuing them. Investigate them. Ask yourself questions about what would there be, what would, if I was harmonious with divine love, what would I do in this situation? What would a harmonious with divine love in economic system look like? It's a good question, isn't it? It would be a gift system, wouldn't it? But would it be given if somebody wasn't willing to work? Probably not, would it? Because if someone's not willing to work, they're not willing to take responsibility for their own life, and if they're not willing to take responsibility for their own life, are they being loving to others? No. So they wouldn't be given something, would they? Can you see that? Can you see how if everything was happening in harmony with divine love, our economic system would be purely and easily functional? <coughs> now, a lot of people are going to criticise down the track and they're going to say, oh, but that's, you know, just utopia. That's not achievable because there's going to be lots of people who don't want to work. Okay, no worries. They don't have to work. I'm not going to force them to work. But am I going to give them the gift no. of their shelter, for example? <coughs> Would that be a loving thing for me to do? 
It's not a loving thing for me to do, is it? Uh, microphone, James. Equally well, would it be an unloving thing to withhold that from them? No. Not if they're unwilling to work for it and they've got the capacity to work for it. Does that make sense? It just sounds a bit conditional. It's not conditional. Yeah. Love isn't conditional. Love is love. What I'm saying by that is, like, if I, if I love myself, would I be willing to work? Yes. Okay. So if, if I'm not willing to work, am I being unloving to myself? Yes. Mm. Am I being unloving to you? Yes. Mm. Now, anybody who's unloving is going to need to, that issue is going to need to be addressed, isn't it? Mm. Now, I, w I wouldn't, now, they can, they're allowed to choose to be unloving, are they not? Sure. So, but how do I deal with that if I'm loving? I don't have to give them something that actually helps them to stay unloving. God doesn't do that with you, and if you're in a state of love, you will not do that with others. Okay, okay. You think about it. When do you receive divine love? When you're totally open to experiencing all of your own emotions and you're longing for love. Is that not when you receive it? Do you receive it when you're all blocked up emotionally and you're shutting down yourself emotionally and using your free will to shut down? Do you receive it then? But is God's love conditional? God wants to give you her love, but the, con but the laws under which God can give you her love are not being enabled. And we need to work in exactly the same manner with every single person on the planet. Even with your own children. I was talking to a, group, a family group the other day. They have uh, three children, they're two sons and a daughter. The two sons are homeschooled and they don't want to do their homeschooling. The youngest of the two sons is nine years of age and cannot read properly. And I said, well, what happens when you go out to a restaurant? I, we read the restaurant to him and he chooses the food. Right. I'm going, what? Like, is that loving? What would be the loving thing to do is say to your son, you don't want to read and that's your prerogative. But I'm not going to read this restaurant menu to you. Here's the restaurant menu. You can choose anything you want on it, but you're not allowed, you won't be able to read it. And I'd actually ask him to make his choice first and then all the rest of them will make a choice. <laughs> and he would bear the results or the consequences of even being unable to read and not wanting to. Does that make sense? Yeah. That is the most loving thing to do. It's not loving to pander to people's emotional injuries. Um, my son who's 14 doesn't want to go to school anymore. He yep. wants to be in a divine love sanctuary school yep. now. And, um, I'm, I've got fears around that as far as socially for him yep. and what's f to hold for his future. I've also fronted the deputy principal about having a space for kids to um, express anger and things like that and I've been told, no, we're here to control the anger. So I've, I've kind of gone down that way a bit but I yep. feel like I would get nowhere. I'd feel like I'd be fighting the system. How many teachers do we have in the audience? Hmm. That's my only comment. <laughs> what, what's the suggestion from that comment? Anyone like to comment about that? Okay, we need to say it in the mic though, otherwise it won't be heard. With full emotion, I deeply desire to have a school on the sanctuary. Yeah, okay. Now, now, can you uh, imagine the type of school? How many of you have read the Anastasia material, the Ringing Cedars stuff? Quite a few. Okay, in there, I think it's, is it the second or third book or something? The third book. Um, it outlines a school that's already running in Russia. Um, why wouldn't you be able to create such a school? This school, what happened in this school, you know, is that the children built the actual school. No yeah, no adults assisted, they only advised. The children built the school. And then the children educate, and the, and the teachers are treated in the same way as the students. All right? And the teachers are there just to provide advice, and the kids learn from each other. 
And you know what? The majority of them are at university level by the time they're 12 years of age. Right? And this is an actual school happening in Russia right at the moment. Why can't that be done? It can be done, but who, what does it need? It needs people who are wanting to be educators to develop through their desires and through their emotions and release their emotions so that they can act in that way. That's what it needs. So the first thing to do is to deal with all of that. And then the next thing to do is focus on, do I have a desire to educate? If I do, then what am I doing about it right now? What am I creating right now? What am I setting up right now? You don't have to wait for any of that. Can you see what we do all the time is we're waiting for someone else to do it. Living in the box. Yeah. Ashkus has an agreement for the purchase of certain properties. One of those incorporates a private... Is it turned on at all? It is turned on, but it's not. It is turned on. Yeah, there we go. Start again, John. Pascus has an agreement for the purchase of certain properties. One of those properties is a private non-denominational school which is built to accommodate 300 boarding children. It's currently used to about 60% uh, of its capacity. Our intention is in the coming year is to incorporate the Chechenin teaching system within that school and expand it to facilitate a demonstration of that teaching program and capabilities. Yeah. All right, so this is why I suggest you have a, you email John and get some stuff sent to you because you'll find that I've thought about lots of different areas of life and help, it'll help you, just as I said, John, they'll help you actually focus on what your passions and desires are. What are your passions and desires? What do you want to create? It'll help you under, identify all of that. <laughs> Pascus needs to hear from each and every one of you. We need all the help possible. Yeah. We're at the end of our capabilities. We've brought the facilities, capacities together, but now we need the people like you to show us how to finish it off. Yeah. But it needs to be people in the right soul condition, doesn't it? You can see each time it needs to be in the right soul condition. And this is where, if we can focus on developing this. So what's ahead of us as people is just so joyous to contemplate, you know? It is just so beautiful to <laughs> contemplate. But, but it requires certain steps <coughs> from us. One of those steps is that I am humble and feel my emotions. Another one of those steps is that I live in my truth all the time. Another one of those steps is that I actually act upon my desires and passions. Instead of just putting my desires and passions in a nice neat little box and keeping me in the corner for when I've got time. That's what it requires of us. The divine truth is going to get you active and you'll enjoy your life doing it when you, when you start allowing it to occur. So what I would like to suggest to you is have a read of the thing that we've, uh, the, today's presentation, because I haven't done hardly any of it. And, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and think about these different areas of our lives that uh, that can be affected by you living in your passions. Now, when you live in your passions, what will happen is that you'll begin identifying what God designed your soul to experience. And you'll start feeling a lot of joy in that process. And so instead of it just being everything being just this emotional drag, working through all of these unhealed and unresolved and unexperienced childhood emotions, you'll also have this other side which is going to be starting to feel all these passions and desires and starting to exercise them. Now many of you have already been led to your passions and desires in your life unknowingly. Many of you have had a life where you've done this, done that, done this, done that, done that. And if you look back at it all, you say, wow, yeah, there were certain things I really enjoyed about that particular thing, but there were also certain things that I didn't like about it. If you go back and visit those things and ask yourself, if I was in a state of divine love, if I, if I was asking God what God would want to happen in this situation, what would God come up with? And start just allowing your imagination to free flow. And once that happens, your spirit friends and God can connect with you and you'll start being a channel for what will change the world. So the reason why I wanted to have this discussion with you is because many of you are waiting for someone else
to show you what you desire and how to get what you desire. No one needs to show you. All you need to do is start feeling your desire and acting upon it. Do you, do you see that? That's all you need to do. And when you really feel your desire and act upon it, if you act harmonious with love, what you create is going to be immensely pleasurable for yourself and also everyone around you. It's just going to be such an inspired place to live in. And if we can start doing this now, by the time world changes occur and by the time there's lots of people who need to be educated in these things, by the time that is ready, we will be ready to show them how to make these transitions, how to make these soul transitions necessary for the world changes to occur. So um, one thing that uh, Mary's always said about me, even in the first century, was that I was a bit of a revolutionary. <laughs> and, uh, and that's probably true, but not in a violent sense or even in a pushing sense or even in a sense where I want to harm anyone's free will. What I'm trying to encourage you to do is to actually start accessing your free will. And pretty soon I'll be having a talk about the law of desire and the law of free will. And what we want to do is start actually accessing our free will and actually start doing things as we desire them and noticing when they're harmonious with love and actually following that path rather than sitting back and hoping or waiting until you're at a certain point. You see, if I had sat back and waited until I was at one with God before I presented this information to you because I was afraid of what you would think of me being Jesus in this terrible state, what, you know what would have happened? I would never have met you. And I would have never have met Mary either. I wouldn't even live in Queensland. I would still be a computer analyst sitting down at my computer not doing anything else and interacting with anyone and I'd be alone. Right? You do not have to wait until you're perfect before you do something. You will become perfected by doing something. Right? So if you can allow yourself to consider that over the coming months, that would be so good. Now tomorrow I'm going to talk about um, it is going to be a mediumship and healing session tomorrow, so hopefully we'll make it interesting for you. And uh, just to do this off camera, um, Brad wanted to talk uh, to you about the sanctuary. Apparently there's going to be some kind of gathering next week. Um, I just want to make one statement really